<laughs> enthusiastic crowd tonight already. Um, uh, perhaps we'll um, gradually uh, get started so as um, uh, to keep on time. Uh, my name is uh, Albert Yee, and I'm the uh, program chief for the uh, hospital's um, Holland Bone and Joint Program, uh, as well as the uh, Division of Orthopedic Surgery um, at the hospital. Uh, and really, on behalf of myself and my colleagues, um, this is really a great uh, opportunity for us to be here tonight um, and to really engage uh, with our community and with our patients. And so we'll have a bit of a, a dialogue and a program tonight focused about uh, hip and knee replacement surgery and um, uh, what uh, many of our patients are asking us, our families, um, and uh, hopefully we can uh, impart at least whatever pearls that we may have in this uh, sort of period of time. Um, I certainly recognize that uh, many of you are able to be here tonight in person, and so uh, thank you. And uh, I recognize the traffic in Toronto every year seems to get a little bit more challenging day over day. Um, and there's also people that are connecting by uh, webcast um, as well. Um, so I guess a little bit of a background uh, to us as a group. Um, uh, Sunnybrook as a hospital has a variety of uh, uh, key sort of uh, clinical priority programs and uh, we support a lot of uh, care relating to trauma, uh, to cancer, uh, women and babies and the Holland uh, Bone and Joint Program which comprises the uh, divisions of um, orthopedic surgery and uh, rheumatology uh, obviously are tasked with the aspect of um, providing um, help as it relates to bone and joint um, health for, 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 for all of us. Um, and so, um, you know, within our group um, in the Division of Orthopedic Surgery, um, uh, we have a lot of uh, activity and a lot of um, experts on the orthopedic side. Um, as a, actually, a, as a single institution, as a hospital, uh, we're probably the largest orthopedic unit in Canada, and uh, we see about uh, uh, 30,000 patients uh, every year uh, through our various clinics. Uh, we perform about uh, just over uh, 5,000 uh, orthopedic uh, surgical procedures uh, and within our orthopedic group we have uh, 19 uh, surgeons, full-time surgeons that are practicing orthopedic surgery. Uh, so there's really a tremendous uh, depth and breadth of expertise uh, within our group. Um, tonight we're focusing on the aspect relating to hip and uh, knee joint replacement care for which the Holland Center downtown uh, we have sort of two areas where we operate out of those. Um, the Holland Center certainly recognized for its innovation in uh, hip and knee uh, care, uh, and uh, we'll cover uh, aspects relating to that from a, a clinic perspective, but we also uh, provide a lot of care as it relates to uh, orthopedic uh, trauma. I've been asked to speak a little bit louder. Uh, orthopedic trauma, uh, spine, uh, complex pelvis, acid tablet conditions, uh, upper extremities, and sport medicine. So, um, uh, with that in mind, uh, we have a, a variety of esteemed colleagues that uh, will provide some uh, presentations in terms of update uh, in terms of hip uh, and knee joint uh, replacement back here. Um, I guess a, a couple of housekeeping items. I, I need to acknowledge and thank uh, Monica um, for uh, keeping us in line um, and on the details tonight. Um, uh, this uh, webcast and archive uh, should be um, posted within the next week and should be available online uh, at the hospital's uh, website. Uh, we'll try to get to as many questions as the audience uh, has tonight, and we're really intentioning this uh, evening to be very uh, interactive. Uh, but we have a, a weekly blog, uh, blog through the hospital that um, uh, is basically named uh, as part of the personal health navigator to help our patients and families navigate uh, the increasingly complex uh, healthcare system, uh, which is written by uh, one of our former uh, journalists, uh, Paul uh, Taylor. Um, so we'll get to as many questions as possible tonight, um, but uh, uh, there's also a, um, I guess, a website uh, or a question link that um, people can uh, uh, put questions into, uh, askpaul uh, at uh, questions.ca. Uh, um, and with the um, seats tonight, you should see not only an evaluation um, form, uh, but also a, a white uh, card, hopefully that's um, at your seats. And so there's a few volunteers around the audience tonight. I see uh, Maggie and Margaret and others. Thank you so much for all your help tonight. Uh, please, any questions that you may have, um, write them down on the white card and the volunteers will go around the uh, audience tonight to pick the questions up and we'll uh, obviously pass them on to our panel. 
Uh, so without further ado, uh, the focus tonight really is on advances in hip and knee joint uh, care. Um, and um, uh, we have uh, uh, three speakers this evening. Uh, the first speaker will be uh, Dr. Bishma Ravi, who will talk about when you should and should not operate and uh, timing of surgery. Uh, he's one of our actually uh, very promising uh, junior faculty recruits to our program. Um, he started in 2016 and um, uh, certainly established himself as a very respected uh, surgeon scientist uh, with a lot of interest specifically in health um, services research and outcomes. Um, and uh, last year, I think, was part of a very distinguished um, uh, North American Traveling Fellowship where um, uh, competitively selected orthopedic surgeons travel around North America to visit other orthopedic units to learn from each other. Uh, so, Vishma, thank you so much for your time, and we look forward to hearing of your presentation of appropriateness and indications and timeliness. Thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, my name is Bishma Ravi. I'm, as Dr. E mentioned, I'm uh, one of the newer, actually the newest recruit at Sunnybrook. And my talk is uh, around thinking about surgery. You know, when do you operate? When do you not operate? When is surgery a realistic option for you? Uh, interestingly, uh, before I get started, uh, this was kind of driven home. One of the volunteers, Levy, there was talking to myself and uh, the other surgeons and mentioned that she was initially scared of getting her knees replaced. And when she finally did get them replaced, she was annoyed that she didn't get them replaced earlier. So there's certainly a balance to be said between getting them done too soon, but also getting them done too late. And it's hard to know when to get, it, uh, to get the surgery. The short answer, so the takeaway message overall, aside from the fact that it's a very personal decision, is you want to get the surgery when the pain is limiting, but not disabling. And when your function is limited, but still capable of improvement. So the two points to think about are pain and function, which are related, but also distinct. And we'll get into uh, what some of the distinguishing factors are. As I'm sure many in this room are aware because they're living with it. Arthritis is a very common condition. If you look at all Canadians, that is from newborns to not so newborn, uh, it affects one in 10. So 10% 10 of all Canadians at any given moment in time are suffering from moderate to severe arthritis. The lifetime risk of developing this condition is almost 50%. So over the course of one's lifetime, 50% of us can expect to have fairly disabling arthritis. It's more common in women and is progressive. So once you get it, it doesn't typically stay at one level. It tends to get worse over time. And some people, that rate is really fast. In other people, it kind of grinds along for a long time. But overall, it will get worse. And it tends to affect weight-bearing joints, uh, hips and knees, ankles, shoulders, but also hands. A lot of people suffer with arthritis in their hands as well. My talk is focused mainly on hip and knee arthritis and joint replacement, but there are options for the other types of arthritis as well. I think to understand arthritis, you need to just take a look at uh, what a normal hip looks like. So on the left, we have a diagram uh, showing essentially a ball and a socket joint. And if you look at it, the thigh bone, which is here, has a ball that comes off it and articulates with the pelvis. Articulates just means forms a joint width. And the weight-bearing surfaces are smooth. It's, uh, it's cartilage, which is smooth, and also uniform. There are not a lot of hills and valleys. It's a smooth sheet. And that means that when you move your hip around, it's a smooth motion. It doesn't hurt. You can walk or climb stairs or run because it's a smooth movement. On the right, you see an x-ray, also of a hip. And uh, here, this same, you see the thigh bone, you see a ball coming off it, and it articulates with the pelvis. And that space in between is the cartilage, the smooth, uniform cartilage. In arthritis, this picture is very different. If you look here, the smooth cartilage is now replaced and looks very roughened. 
In some areas, the cartilage has been worn down and is almost on bone. In other places, you basically have bone rubbing against bone. And it's not only the fact that the cartilage doesn't look smooth, the bone doesn't look smooth. The smooth, uh, sorry, the bone has a lot of rough surfaces. All those rough surfaces cause pain because now movements hurt. Similarly, on the right, if you look at the x-ray, previously there was, a, there was a space between the ball and the socket. Not anymore. Now it's essentially bone rubbing against bone, which as I'm sure uh, we all can understand, is painful. The story is similar in knees. If you look at the image on the left, a knee joint essentially can be thought of as your thigh bone and your shin bone and the space in between represents the cartilage. There's also a kneecap, which is a little hard to see here, but there's also a joint between the kneecap and the thigh bone. And once again, that has a, a smooth cartilage in between. That means here, this, this joint is kind of like a hinge joint, like opening and closing a door. That movement is smooth, except when it isn't. As you lose the cartilage, you get bone rubbing against bone. And knee arthritis, uh, tends to be even more painful than hip arthritis. You know, people generally I find, and I think most have shown that people with hip arthritis suffer, suffer a lot, but they tend to hold, they can hold surgery off a little later in some cases, whereas knee arthritis tends to really, uh, really be painful. And ultimately, that's the way to think of it. These are painful conditions. They cause a lot of problems and they can be very limiting. People stop doing things because it just hurts to do them. So that brings us to a joint replacement. What is a joint replacement? I think there's a lot of information out there, and if you look on the internet, a lot of misinformation on what a joint replacement actually is. But it's fairly straightforward. It's not a bionic joint by any means. It's basically, if you look at a knee, we put a metal cap on your thigh bone, another metal cap on your shin bone, and the space in between here is a plastic piece which you can't see on the x-ray, and that's the new joint. And because the plastic is smooth and the metal is smooth, it means you have a smooth range of motion. Now you can walk without your bone rubbing against bone. Similarly in the hip, this metal component goes into your thigh bone. We put a metal head on it, in your pelvis, we put a metal cup. Some, uh, sometimes we add screws to help hold the cup in place. And there's a plastic piece in between. And the new hip is formed by the ball and the plastic. And that again allows for a smooth range of motion. So you can move your hip without bone grinding on bone. And while there are variations in terms of surgical approach or Different companies make different brands and they try to sell different types of plastic or different types of heads. Ultimately, this is essentially what all hip and knee replacements come down to for the most part. This kind of a device. You are replacing bony surfaces that are roughened, that are rubbing against each other with smooth surfaces. And doing so in a manner where you preserve all the muscles and tendons and everything else that attach so that you can still do your movements but now they don't hurt. While we're looking at these pictures, I'll mention one other factor with timing that is less relevant now than it was maybe 20 or 30 years ago, is these components, particularly the plastic piece we meant we uh, showed here and in the knee, can wear out over time. Or these implants, the metal components, can loosen over time. And that was certainly, uh, I would say, more true with some of the older implants that are being used that can still happen with the newer implants. So one factor to think about is if you get surgery and you're really young, say in your 30s or 40s, the odds of you needing another surgery in your lifetime are reasonable because the implants are, only this, uh, are not necessarily designed to last 60 years. They might, but they're not designed necessarily to do that. We talked about pain. Does joint replacement affect pain? Yes, it does. This is a study looking at around 250 Canadians, but this is just one study out of thousands. I've just picked uh, it because it's a Canadian study. This looked at uh, patients 
before their surgery, here, six months after their surgery, and 12 months after their surgery. As you go up, your pain reduces. So on the left, as you go up on the scale, it means you have less pain. It's a little confusing. The further you, the closer you are to 20, the worse pain you have. People that start before they have their joint replacements had fairly terrible pain, and they all improved by 12 months. Interestingly, and that I think this is what most surgeons see, patients with hip replacements improved fairly quickly, almost immediately within the first few weeks. They feel better. Now, granted, you still have to get over the pain of surgery itself. I mean, surgery does cause pain initially, but that is typically well controlled with the drugs we give and uh, other things we can do to try and minimize that pain. But once you get over that, most hip replacement patients feel good fairly quickly. With the knees, it takes a little bit longer, maybe between three to six months, depending on probably closer to three, five, uh, frankly, before you feel really good. And some of that has to do with the fact that a knee replacement is a little tougher in terms of rehab. You need to work a little harder afterwards to make sure you don't get stiff. And it's hard because you just had surgery and someone's coming around and bending your knee. So that can be challenging. But ultimately, patients do quite well. But arthritis doesn't just affect you in terms of giving you pain. I mentioned earlier, it can also affect your functioning. You know, the ability to play light sports, say jogging or pickleball, the ability to climb stairs in your own home, the ability to walk. You know, there are many people that say that they used to enjoy taking walks and now they don't. They don't leave the house because they're scared that if they go outside, they don't feel steady on their feet anymore. Or they're worried that they won't be able to do anything once they leave the house, so they kind of stay indoors. And I think this happens to a lot of people over time. Joint replacement also improves your function. So this is that same study looking at a, a set of like 250 Canadians, and they found uh, if you look at the left here, the white is people just before surgery, and all these uh, bar graphs on the left are regarding pain, and this is regarding physical function. And as you proceed to about six months and then 12 months, pain improves and function improves. And this black bar here, are people without arthritis. So you actually get to a state where you're essentially living in terms of pain and function as someone your own age that doesn't have arthritis. So that's very positive. But there's always a but in medicine. <laughs> <laughs> Let's think about function as four grades. Grade one being the best. Say someone that can still run, so fairly high level, and grade four being someone that's become so disabled from their arthritis that they have to use a wheelchair or maybe a walker, and they can't even use a, uh, they can't walk without aids even in their own home, so quite disabled from arthritis. Now, obviously, that could be for many reasons. We're talking mainly, let's say this is mainly because of arthritis. A joint replacement in all likelihood will take you up one grade, maybe two grades, but it cannot take you from grade four to grade one. The reason I mentioned that is the classic thinking, especially from uh, uh, people that may not be as familiar with arthritis or at least with surgical management of arthritis used to be, don't do anything until you're in a wheelchair. Don't do anything until you really absolutely need it which is reasonable because surgery should always be taken seriously. It's not something to just do. But if you wait till you're in a wheelchair, you have to realize that you may always have to use a cane after the surgery. It's unlikely that you'll go from being able to, oh, being stuck in a wheelchair to walking on your own without any trouble because the damage of arthritis is not just the bones and the cartilage. It's also your muscles. It's everything else. You defunction overall. You can imagine that if you spend a couple of years not leaving your home, a new hip is not necessarily going to give you all the strength and everything else you need to do so. So if we look at the ladder and you think about yourselves, a time to consider joint replacement might be when you're about entering grade three, which is hard to know what different grades are. I'll, I'll tell you when you can, uh, who can help you figure that out. If you're grade one, you're doing well. You don't need a joint replacement. If you're grade two, 
You know, you might go up to a grade one, but is it that big an improvement? It might make more sense to wait. If you're grade three, this is a good, you know, real time to start considering it because once you get to a grade four, the improvements you can expect maybe aren't as great. So that classic thinking of, you know, don't do anything until you are really disabled, I think it's not doing anyone any favors. So don't wait till you get here. There's another way to think about the impact of pain and lack of physical function. So if you have a lot of pain and you don't have a lot of function, you're unlikely to do much. I mean, you're most likely just gonna get up, stay around the house, maybe you walk outside for a bit, but realistically, if you're anything like me, you're gonna sit on your couch and watch TV most of the day. Basically, that's it. Hope someone drops a baby in your lap to play with. The impact of physical activity on our overall health is immense. So we're built to move, and if you can't move, it's on the, the effect on your heart is on par, so equal, to being morbidly obese or being a heavy smoker. In the long run, the impact is quite similar. This is a study looking at Canadians, and it's found that Unfortunately, once you get to people in their 50s, 60s, and particularly 70s, almost 60 to 70% of people in those age groups are inactive. And generally, it's because of arthritis. They can't move, so they don't move. The US, the picture is quite similar, and a little worse because they are the US after all. <laughs> Sorry. Good one. Um, there have been studies showing that persons with arthritis, when compared to people of the same age, the same sex, similar health conditions, so high blood pressure, diabetes, and everything else, people with arthritis are more likely to die earlier and are more likely to die from cardiovascular disease, so heart attack or a stroke. And a lot of that is likely because they're inactive. So despite maybe watching what they're eating, making sure they're on top of their sugars. If they can't move, they can't be active, they still get the heart disease. Uh, the blue is people with arthritis, and the rise is compared to people in red that, again, similar age, similar sex, or same sex, I should say, everything else, and this is what uh, happens. Our, uh, a joint replacement can affect that. Uh, there's really only one study demonstrating that getting a joint replacement in the long run can improve your heart health if only because you get up and you move more. I should add a caveat that surgery, as I mentioned earlier, should always take it seriously. It does come with risks. This study only applies to people who actually survive the surgery. <laughs> so, uh, it's not to say a lot of people don't survive surgery, but I just think it's important that if you, uh, if I saw someone in their late or late 80s or early 80s but had severe heart disease, I probably would not operate on that person because I couldn't look them in the eye and tell them getting a new hip will really help your heart. So you may be too far gone again. Um, and these results are fairly consistent with literature demonstrating the impact of just improved activity in people in this age group. Again, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, just being active. And active, by the way, if you look at the American Heart Association or equivalent community associations, their guidelines aren't saying you have to get up and go jogging every day. It's walk for half an hour every day. Right? It's fairly simple. It's not uh, uh, particularly onerous. But the fact is, a lot of people can't do that. Walking for half an hour is, is hard for a lot of people. Again, because of arthritis, predominantly. There are other reasons, but predominantly it's arthritis. I think we all know from watching the news that Canada, and North America as a whole, but certainly Canada, is in the midst of an opioid crisis. And one of the uh, leading factors we know is because of imported drugs that make it onto our streets for various reasons. But there's also a huge burden of prescription opioids that are out there. And a lot of the media talks about the fairly dramatic deaths of people in their teenage years or in their 20s or 30s because it is dramatic and it's always uh, 
terrible when a life is cut short. But there's also an increasing burden in people in their 60s and 70s and 80s of opioid dependence. And these are people, again, that typically avoided smoking their whole life and had good habits, but get started on an opioid because they have terrible arthritis and they're maybe scared of surgery or don't have access to surgery. But it ends up being a problem. This graph looks at all opioid use in people at surgery and just before surgery. I'll just say this big spike right here are prescriptions people get after surgery, which makes sense. You've just had surgery, so someone gives you a prescription and says, take some of these drugs. A lot of people fill it, and most people use some and don't use all. But if you look before, in the years leading up to the surgery, at any given moment in time, 10% of people with arthritis have a prescription for opioids, which are fairly strong meds, and it increases all the way up to their surgery. So it kind of spikes. These are higher levels than you see with other conditions, except maybe cancer, occasionally back pain. Oh dear, that's bad. This blank slide, uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> the average dose for someone with arthritis, so these are doses that typically come from their family doctors, okay? The average dose in terms of morphine equivalents is second only to prescriptions people get for dental pain. So you can imagine if anyone's had a dental emergency, it's incredibly painful. And at that point, you might expect your dentist to give you some medication. But arthritis is a chronic condition, and people are getting these high prescription doses to deal with terrible pain, but unfortunately, it has an impact in the long run. So if you are using a lot of opioids, the odds of you having a complication after your surgery shoot up. You're far more likely to get pneumonia after your surgery. You're far more likely to return to an emergency room or be readmitted. And your risk of getting an infection after surgery, which is the one thing that uh, should scare everyone, is huge. It's almost twice, especially if you're a chronic user of opioids. We found that Almost 50% of people that get joint replacements use opioids at some point prior to surgery, usually the, by some point, I mean within the last year before their surgery. Most prescriptions come from family doctors, again, because family doctors are trying to manage what is a chronic condition that could get better with surgery. And it, use of opioids really increases your risk of complications. I spent a lot of time talking about joint replacements and what arthritis is. Is joint replacement the only option? No, not at all. There are other options. The first is something that most people do, which is activity modification. You change what you do. So if there's a particular sport that brings it up, some people will say, you know, I'll, I'll try swimming instead of running. I'll try doing something else. So that makes sense. Some people downsize. They say, instead of getting a house upstairs, I'll move to a bungalow or I'll get a condo somewhere, downsize to an apartment. It's all sensible strategies. But again, there's only so much you can modify until you're not doing anything you want to do. You're not doing anything that gives you pleasure. It's like walking outside. Weight loss is uh, a very important and very powerful uh, tool that we can all use. And a little weight, uh, if you lose two pounds around the stomach, it's maybe six pounds at the knee. That's what it feels like. So there is an... Uh, increased effect of weight loss in the joints. But it's hard because it's hard. I have a tough time telling people, and I see this all the time where someone says, I'm trying to lose weight, but I can't do anything. I can't walk. I can't, certainly can't run. And I've tried changing my diet, but diets only go so far. Diets without exercise can only take you so far. And again, like I made a joke earlier, but realistically, if you, don't, if you can't move, you tend to sit and eat. I think that's what most people do. Physiotherapy is probably the most powerful option on this list because physiotherapy will help uh, strengthen muscles and offload the joint onto the muscles and tendons and everything else that can maybe take some of the load off and get you moving again, get you moving in a better, more efficient manner that may take a lot of your pain away. So physiotherapy is always worth considering and exhausting. But again, you don't want to do anything ad nauseum. If physio starts to hurt, it might be worth thinking about seeing a physician getting some x-rays to make sure there's nothing else going on or that your arthritis is not so far gone 
that you can't realistically expect physiotherapy to help you. Uh, injections and arthroscopy are certainly very popular. Um, and a lot of websites, especially US-based websites, sell these, and unfortunately, increasingly in Canada. Um, in terms of injections, there are people that offer joint supplements that are grown usually from egg yolk or something else, or you can get uh, cortisone, which is a short-term solution. It's a steroid that can help you get through for a couple of weeks, maybe months, if you're lucky. There are people out there that will spin your blood and inject platelets into your joint, or stem cells. Uh, none of these work. They all cost a lot of money. They're probably not worth doing, but I will be offering a sale outside if anyone is interested. <laughs> there are people that suggest scoping the joint with a camera. So going inside of the camera, and they often sell it as just cleaning up the joint. We'll clean it up, and you'll get up and move. These do not work. That they demonstrated not to work. Um, certainly, I would not uh, realistically weigh them in anyone over 40, barring very specific symptoms. So, injections and arthroscopy, or someone sticking a scope in your, your camera in your knee or hip, uh, I would venture and very, uh, it's not useful in most circumstances. As I said, it's important to try non-operative options, but not ad nauseum. If you find something is not working, if you find something is making your pain worse, take a step back and think about whether it's the right option for you. One thing I, I hear from a lot of patients, uh, or not patients, but people at talks like this is it's intimidating sometimes to go and see a surgeon about it. It's finally admitting to yourself that you might need a joint replacement, which is hard. But when you see a surgeon, you're seeing someone that might be taking you down the surgery path, and you're not sure you've exhausted everything else. You know, you're not sure you want surgery, but you're talking to someone that only offers surgery, and it can be a little confusing. So if I can plug the Sunnybrook system here, one thing we have that I think is unique but special is an assessment center. So people that are referred to the Sunnybrook Assessment Center are seen within weeks by a physiotherapist, who assesses you and, and really spends time with you, try to understand your life, what your needs are, and tries to determine whether or not you exhausted all your other options before seeing a surgeon. And once they make that determination, and once they, get, uh, once they determine that someone has really gotten to the stage where they've used everything else up and essentially come to the place of surgery, they then make the recommendation for you to see a surgeon. So they work with you, and it's... You know, surgeons are usually rushed and you're spending maybe 10 minutes with them, but here's someone that can spend half an hour with you, maybe an hour, really go through your life and try to explain things to you so you understand them. And I think that is one of the most uh, special parts of the Sunnybrook experience, is someone that takes the time to talk to you and explain things to you so you understand if there is room for improvement in your own choices before considering the need for surgery. Anyway, that's my talk. I hope it's been uh, useful. Thank you. So, so thanks so much. I appreciate Perhaps I can have you sort of maybe up here um, and take some questions along along the way. Uh, you can see why we asked that uh, all the hard questions in our group and performs all the research that are related to uh, the same. Um, and I guess there's a bit of a calibration to those of us on the panel, and uh, I'll be sort of moderating the dialogue this evening. Um, I guess, hey, how many people in the group tonight have actually had a different replacement? Okay. Uh, how many may be contemplating a uh, different replacement? Okay. So we've got uh, you know a bit of a spread on that, um, and uh, so. You know, I'll follow up, I guess, with a few questions. Um, I think the volunteers are going around if there's questions from uh, the group. Um, just as we do so, um, is uh, Stephen Beatty here? Um, um, I think uh, Dr. Ravi spoke a little bit about the um, uh, central intake and assessment model. So there's a couple of people here tonight from sort of a uh, clinical, sort of operational perspective at the hospital level. So I just want to acknowledge uh, Amber May McLeod, uh, maybe Henry can stand up for a little bit, and uh, Jeremy Murahan, who's the uh, medical director of the Holland Center. So 
Uh, Anne Marie is the operations director of our program. Uh, John Murnahan is the uh, medical director. We have a few other folks, uh, Natalie Chung Sayers and others, uh, that have really been instrumental in putting together uh, a very uh, patient oriented um, pathway um, that uh, really has been helpful to us as physicians uh, and really brings together the entire interprofessional team to provide advice uh, and to help um, individuals sort of navigate the uh, increasingly complex uh, medical system. That's great. Okay. Um, so, first question um, Does osteoporosis make hip or knee surgery uh, more complicated? Um, and how does that impact success? Uh, is it, uh, can we get the mic? Uh, I think we're on there. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Do uh, hit the button. That's it. Push. Okay. Uh, <laughs> osteoporosis does have an impact. Osteoporosis, uh, for those who don't know, is basically a condition where your bones become softer and therefore weaker and more prone to break. And during surgery, that can have an impact because. The surgery itself can lead to a fracture uh, intraoperatively, so a fracture during the surgery. That being said, uh, we, uh, we make different surgical decisions, and some of that has weaker bone. There are things we can do to lower the risk. Uh, one of the advantages of a place like Cybro or some other major centers is they are high volume centers. So you're being treated by surgeons that maybe perform two to three hundred joint replacements a year, in many cases quite a bit more. And what that means is there's a comfort level that develops in terms of identifying patients that may be at risk for some of these complications and dealing with them beforehand. So it does increase the risk for intraoperative fracture, but there are things we can do about it to lower that risk. Okay, um, I'll head on to the second question before the next uh, presentation. We'll have uh, lots of time for Q&A at the end, so it's, it's great there's the, the whole list of questions. We should answer answer all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. We'll give all the hard questions to Dr. Rowdy. Um, I guess you talked a little bit about disability and, um, uh, and, and pain. And you don't want to be in a situation necessarily where you're, you're painful and you're in a wheelchair type of environment. Um, but you know uh, how much pain is acceptable, and um, uh, you know when you do you inquire, you know, is, is pain harmful to what may be needed sort of in the future? So uh, this question relates to uh, uh, I'm 81 years of age. Um, my knees hurt more in the summer when I play tennis. I don't play tennis <laughs> indoors. Never mind sort of navigating the, uh, the baby traffic on, on route in and out. Um, uh, to give my visa a, a break. So, what age will it be ineligible um, to be considered for joint replacement surgery? Thank you. That's a, that's a great question. Uh, I think I can speak for my, my, my senior, or senior, my colleagues here, when I say that there's not necessarily an age limit in terms of the, the number of years you've been on the planet, by, by which I mean there's no sign saying if you're over 93, I will not operate on you. And it's more about your health overall. So someone could come in, I've operated on someone, a few people in their 90s and performed hip replacements because they were healthy. And even if they were going to be on the be alive for maybe only a few more years, they just said, I don't want to live in this kind of pain. So I was happy to do the procedure and they did fairly well. But there are people I've turned down for surgery who are maybe in their 70s and profoundly sick for. Uh, their heart or other reasons. So it's more about your overall health than it is a number. So to answer the question, there is no age where I will refuse to operate on someone. There's more about your overall health that uh, affects this decision. Great. So thanks so much. Um, so I guess um, we'll gradually move on to the next presentation. I've got a whole card next, so, uh, that questions. I'll try to sort of put them in. And organize them sort of thematically in between the presentations. Uh, the next uh, presentation will be provided by Dr. Hans Krieger. Uh, he has uh, he's uh, been uh, our uh, key leader. Uh, he's been the um, 
uh, division head for uh, orthopedics and uh, all in uh, fully joint program chief. Uh, he's been the inaugural uh, Martin Tile chair uh, in uh, orthopedic uh, surgery. Uh, is uh, certainly well recognized uh, from a professional level in terms of his expertise, not only in hip and knee joint replacement surgery, uh, but also a complex uh, orthopedic trauma and trauma specifically of the, uh, uh, the pelvis, the hip, uh, and um, hip joint and acetabular uh, area. And so we're very privileged to have uh, our computer be here uh, with us tonight. He's an engaging uh, speaker and he's going to provide a bit of an update to us um, as we think a little bit more about uh, total joint replacement surgery, specifically uh, around the hip. Thank you, Hans. Great. So my first task is to uh, see if the slides will load. Um, I, I'm a Macintosh user. Who here is a Macintosh user? Yeah, and this is a PC, so. All right, I, I think we've already messed it up here. So we basically, uh, we basically want to just, uh, know, yeah, I think we're good here. All right. So I'm going to talk about some options there are in total hip replacement and specifically focus on how to get to the hip, the front, the back, the side, because this is a real topical issue right now, isn't it? I see some of you nodding. A lot of you have, have heard about this. So let's start by taking a look inside your hip. So this happens all the time, but if I were to ask you, where is your hip? Some of you will point to back here. You know, that's your hip. Some of you will point to the side and say, well, that's my hip. So who, who thinks the slide on the left is correct? The right, who thinks the slide on the right? You know, actually, None of these are correct. <laughs> so let's take a look. The, the hip is sort of the nerves from the front of the hip. The front of your leg are where you feel hip joint pain typically. So here's a hip looking inside the hip from the front. And then on the far side, you see a, a gnarled old hip with arthritis. And in fact, this is where most of the arthritic hip pain is felt, in the front of the hip and maybe down even into the knee. So sometimes knee pain can be from hip joint arthritis. So here's what happens. You see that hip deteriorating and sort of getting crushed down as the nice white cartilage wears away. And what we do when we do a hip replacement is we core out the bone on the socket side and then shape it so that there's just some good cancellous bone there. And on the other side, we shape that to fit a component in here. And that's the metal part that goes into the femur bone. And then we put a ball on top of that. And then inside the socket, we put a metal socket with or without screws. There's some screws going in. <laughs> and then we put a liner in there. And just like B showed you, that's the components of a hip. It's modular, it's four pieces. And here's a close-up microscopic look of a modern uncemented hip where the bone grows into the little pores of metal and secures the hip. And that's what happens, that's a hip replacement. Four pieces. Now that looked pretty easy, didn't it? You know, they just <laughs> pop the pieces out, cut it off and put a new one in. That's a total hip replacement. That's so easy. What, what is this? So when we access the hip joint, we have to work around the muscles, and we'll talk about that now. So there's a posterior approach, and just uh, try to remember that name, Kofer, Kofer Langenbeck. Kofer Langenbeck is one of the approaches. Gibson, Superpath, um, that you may have heard of. Those are all from the back of the hip joint, getting it. Then there is the side of the hip, the Harding and the Watson-Jones approach. And this isn't a totally exhaustive list. These are just the most common ones. And then the front, the direct anterior approach, the magic approach. And it's also called the Hooter approach or the Smith-Peterson approach. So why are there different approaches? If, if 
there's you know one that's better why, why isn't there just one approach well it's all about the gluteus medius muscle that you see highlighted there you saw it from the back the side and now the front and that muscle is important because it's the muscle that when you walk you need to not limp so if that muscle is weak or torn or damaged you will have a limp you won't be able to walk without limping and that's where it sits right there in your body so you can see that with the posterior approach the muscle that's highlighted is the gluteus maximus it's in the way so we have to split that or go in front of it to get to the hip from the back so the other slide on your right there has the gluteus maximus removed and now you see these muscles called the short external rotators and they either have to be divided in the classic posterior approaches to get that the hip joint and then you have to repair them so you know that involves taking down some tendons and repairing them and it does avoid the gluteus medius muscle so there's no limb but with the older techniques, there was a higher dislocation rate. The newer techniques of posterior approach actually have done away with that. So if you've got a surgeon that does this approach and does it well, and in a modern way, it does very well. Who here has heard of the super path approach? Anybody? Super path? No? So the super path, that's the acronym that stands for supercapsular percutaneously assisted total hip replacement. It sounds really good, doesn't it? So the concept is you still have to split that gluteus maximus muscle, but once that's gone, you just try to go in that little space between that gluteus medius muscle and the piriformis uh, muscle there, the top of those golden highlighted muscles. And the problem is it's kind of linked to a specific manufacturer and it doesn't apply to all patients. Depending on the type of arthritis, you just can't get into that space safely. So it's uh, very limited in that way. The lateral approach is the most common, bar none, around the world. Uh, the lateral approach being the Harding and Watson Jones approaches. And there's a slight difference between the two. So again, we see there the muscles highlighted from back to front, gluteus maximus, gluteus medius, and then a new muscle in the front called the tensor fascia. That's this muscle right here. And when we take the tensor fascia away, we uncover the gluteus minimus highlighted in gold there. So both of these hip joint or these lateral approaches actually go to the capsule from the front. So they are a type of anterior approach. And the Harding approach <laughs> elevates a little bit of the gluteus medius and minimus muscle. And the Watson Jones goes in front of the gluteus medius and minimus muscle. But both of them go behind this fascia lata, tensor fascia lata muscle. And that again is the tensor fascia muscle removed. You can see the two muscles highlighted in gold, the gluteus medius muscle here and the gluteus minimus muscle below. So with these approaches, there's minimal or no dissection with Watson Jones potentially of the gluteus medius and minimus. And they go behind this tensor fascia laterals. It's got a low complication rate and it's applicable to all comers. So it doesn't matter what type of arthritis you have, you can have this approach to do your hip replacement. And over the years, initially it was sort of a large incision, large approach. It's become quite minimally invasive. But still, you can see even with minimally invasive approach, some patients have a limp early on because of the retraction of the muscle and that kind of weakens it for a period of time. So some people limp early on, but most of those go away and very few have a chronic limp. So this is an example of a patient uh, a number of years ago with a Harding approach and it's a small incision and there you see the uh, the uh, component down in the depths there. So now, here we get to the direct anterior approach, the new approach. So remember the Watson Jones went behind that uh, gold highlighted muscle, right? So the direct anterior approach, or DAA, goes in front 
of the tensor fascia muscle. Once you take the tensor fascia muscle away, it goes in the same interval that the Harding and the Watson-Jones go. It just goes on the other side of the tensor fascia muscle. So it does avoid the gluteus medius and minimus muscle, again, minimizing the risk of limp. The problem is there's a learning curve, and during the learning curve, when your surgeon is learning the procedure, there's an increased complication rate. And some of those complications, breaking the femur bone, are difficult to fix from that approach. <laughs> some people like to use specialized equipment, we'll talk about that a little bit. And it can't be used in all patients. For example, tomorrow I'm doing three patients with hip replacements, and only two of them are eligible for this direct anterior approach. And depending on the type of patient anatomy, you simply can't get to it from the front. And there's a nerve, a sensory nerve, but there's a nerve that's injured in a high percentage of patients that gives sensation to your lateral thigh. So let's just look at that nerve. So I don't know if the purple shows up very well. It shows up probably for those who are logged in uh, to the webcast. But hopefully you can see there's a purple nerve outlined there. That's the typical course of this sensory nerve that gives you sensation to the thigh. So it's behind that, or it's in front of that tensor fascia muscle, and the incision is over the tensor fascia, so it's pretty safe. And 36% of the time, oops, 36% of the time, this is where the, the nerve courses and the incision in the top panel in white, and the cursor being white, it doesn't show up on a white background. Fancy that, eh? White cursor on a white background. So I can't really show it to you. But the top panel is the typical. So 36% of the time, the nerve should be in front of where the incision is. But the rest of the time, Part of the nerve, or all of the nerve, crosses the incision and would be damaged by the approach. Now, it's just causing some numbness to the thigh, but it is something that annoys some people. All right, this is the audience participation part of the, uh, the program. You'll have to vote on this, okay? How long has the direct anterior approach been used? Who says less than five years, okay? Who says five to 10 years? 10 to 15, and who thinks it's been more than 15? One lone, one lone person. <laughs> Are you ready for the correct answer? 150 years. It's not new at all. So, Carl Hooter, and this approach is sometimes called the Hooter approach, described it in 1880. 1880. He was a German surgeon and he worked as an assistant to remember, I told you to remember that name, Koffer Langenbach. He was Langenbach's assistant and he thought the posterior approach to the hip was, was uh, had some issues so he developed this approach in 1880. It was picked up by Marius Nygaard Smith Peterson, a Norwegian born American surgeon who uh, you know, sort of rediscovered it when he was uh, working in Boston. And uh, his claim to fame was he operated, who, who knows who Arthur Godfrey is? Arthur. So he did Arthur Godfrey's hip and died of a heart attack a couple of days later. Not Arthur Godfrey, he lived till he was uh, a ripe old age. But, you know, so Smith Peterson also used the direct anterior probe. And it's used all the time this operation, this approach. This is my first year at Sunnybrook. I came to Sunnybrook uh, on staff in 1995. This is somebody with a broken hip. This is a CT scan cut of a broken hip in a young person. We use that approach all the time to get to the hip, to fix a broken hip. So that was in 1995, that was a car crash. MVC stands for motor vehicle collision. So that was a car accident. So that's what that looked like there in the operating room. But so this is more recently. This is a motor vehicle crash. It's a gunshot. Same sort of injury. You can see an X-ray of the hip, a bullet lodged in there. We use the same approach to fix this young man with a, 
a bullet lodged in his hip and it destroyed hip train. So it's used all the time. Joel Mata, who is uh, a colleague in the States in California, he started using this approach to do hip replacements routinely in 1996. And he had learned how to do pelvic nasotabular surgery on a special table called the Mata table. Funnily enough, that's his name, Joel Mata, so he uses the Mata table. He sells it for a good, uh, good deal of money. And uh, he liked, he sort of promoted this use of the special table. So you might say, well, why a special table to do these hip replacements? So remember, the approach to get to the hip is old. Doing a hip replacement through it dates back to the mid-90s, so 1995, 96. So remember, this is where you have to get to, where the blue arrow is. And you see, you don't want to stretch that gluteus medius muscle very much. So hyperextending or bringing the leg back will expose that sort of area a little bit better. So a special table allows you to do that. So with the traction table, popularized by Dr. Maud and others, you can hyperextend the hip. It's very powerful, and you can also pull on the hip and uh, this was sort of the earliest uh, approach to the, to the femur side. And it's very powerful, as I say, but you know, you can also break the leg. By, by, <laughs> and it's a bit fiddly, you know, it requires an experienced team to position the leg and the surgeon has to work with a team. And uh, if you're not careful, it, 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 it was shown in the early days to increase the infection risk. And many, for a variety of reasons, still wear lead and do x-rays during the procedure to, you know, sort of, uh, because you can't feel the tension on the hip because it's an attraction table. So the x-rays sort of allow you to see where the position of things are. So it's still very popular and many surgeons continue to use this technique to this day. So if hip hyperextension helps you to get at the hip, others, figured, okay, well, let's forget about the traction because that kind of pulls on the leg. There's this fracture risk and you need x-rays. Why not just use a regular table and kind of set it up in such a way that you can extend the hip? So there are pivot points on a regular table. This is a regular old operating room table. And you can drop this part of the table down. And so this is a schema of a bump on a regular table, dropping the leg down to hyperextend the leg and to get that spot that you need to access. Now you can see here on your right, the surgeon's operating and it doesn't show up that well on the screen, but the leg is down near sort of the surgeon's knee. And again, anything below the waist is considered not really that sterile in surgical circles. So again, you know, this, this is used and it's very popular, but uh, some of us have concerns about this. So can you do this operation from the front without hyperextending the leg? So Chris Corton did his PhD on the anatomy of the hip. Can you imagine spending five years studying the anatomy of the hip? That's what he did. And he came up with the anatomy where you see the green, that is the hip capsule at the top of the hip. And that's what it looks like in the operating room. The green corresponds to the green, and those tendons are there. And just by releasing the capsule in a specific way, out pops, well, this is the socket side, but out pops the hip joint. You can see there, you know, that's uh, the hip, the femur bone being prepared. And just by crossing the legs under one underneath the other, you can get enough extension to pull the leg up and move. So that's the technique that uses no special table to get at the hip. So who's heard about, you know, you can do outpatient surgery with this magic direct anterior new approach from 150 years ago. Okay, so let's put that into perspective. So here's an ad, you know, ad from the States. We don't advertise in Canada uh, for a whole bunch of reasons, but outpatient hip replacement solves years of hip pain. So my first outpatient hip replacement was in 1995. He was a plastic surgeon who drank a bit and signed himself out because he wanted to go have a drink uh, the day of his surgery. 
And he had nothing at home. He had his wife at home who was walking around behind him, pulling him, saying, don't go home, don't go home. But he went home, day one. And that was in the days when we didn't do minimally invasive anything. We did maximally invasive, big cuts, lateral approach. And he was just fine. When he came back to see me in the clinic, he thanked me for letting him go. <laughs> Not putting him on a form one, so-called, you know, forcing him to say. So the bottom line, and, and this isn't just, this was a case example to illustrate the point, but there's research on it. So the hospital length of stay depends on the personality of the patient, their situation and home supports, and the teaching that they get in preparation. And then to some degree, the pain and function can be affected by the quality of surgery. If your surgeon's a Wolverine and dissecting around there, you're going to have lots of pain. But if the surgeon does a modern approach, you've got modern pain management, your pain is going to be such that it could theoretically be done with the right kind of environment as an outpatient procedure. And the programs that are set up, so Ottawa, our colleagues in Ottawa have a program set up, patient comes in, they go home to, a, or they don't go home, they go to a hotel the same day, they have phone calls with physiotherapists and nurses and make sure everything's okay, and then they go home a couple of days later. So you can do that. You can do that with any approach, back, front, side, doesn't matter. There's nothing magic about the direct anterior approach in outpatient surgery. So again, the right patient properly chosen can go home the same day if they want to with any modern approach. So th this is interesting. I just did this for fun. So uh, if you type in Google and you put an anterior total hip replacement, you get 5.6 million hits. <laughs> if you type in sex, you get 2.9 million hits. <laughs> so the direct approach is better than sex. This is great, great stuff. So let's summarize the actual evidence. So the evidence suggests don't be the first patient of somebody who hasn't trained with somebody else because the complication rate is high. Okay, so that's point number one. All other things being equal, that is you've got an expert doing everything, the anterior approach has an earlier blip of better uh, early function, return to function, very early. We're talking within the first few days to first few weeks. There's absolutely no difference in longer term outcomes. By six weeks, usually, and definitely by three months, they're all the same. If the procedures are all done in expert hands, all other things being equal. So uh, I don't know if this will play, but so this is an example of an early day one post op direct anterior hip. <laughs> So that's great, you know. And so that's day one after an anterior hip, and it's his left side. The, the, the experienced people will see it's his left side that's been replaced, because he actually does have a little limb. See there on the left side, limb, limb. But it's not bad, right? So, you know, and, and I consider myself an expert in the lateral approach. I used to do posterior approach. I do that rarely now for specific indications. And so, Doing an expert lateral and an expert anterior, this I could never achieve with a lateral day one. But at six weeks, they're all the same, you know? So if, if somebody says, well, this is really, really important to me, to, you know, day one, uh, that's the only difference. And here I'll just show you another. Uh, this is somebody who had both hips replaced. Come back. And he's being ordered around by my very bossy fellow, you know? <laughs> So he's there with, with both hips. So again, the summary is this direct anterior approach isn't new at all. It's 150 years old, and it's been used for total hips since the mid-90s. And it can be done with hyperextension, and you can hyperextend the hip on a special table, or you can hyperextend it on just a regular table, or you can do it without hyperextending, and that's just a regular normal operating room. And all other things being equal, as you saw in those two videos, it may have an earlier rehab potential, but 
All modern approaches are minimally invasive, and all modern approaches have excellent long-term advantages. So that's the bottom line right there. Thank you. All right, so thanks so much, uh, Dr. Krieger. Um, a very informative uh, <laughs> and uh, the Google search and so forth. Um, <laughs> I guess a couple of questions, just sort of summarizing some comments. And thanks so much for really an update on uh, considerations of surgical uh, approaches. Uh, there's a question about um, the performance of various different types of prostheses. So in the hip, you can cement or not cement. Uh, Go to your car dealer and get an Audi or a BMW or a general motors vehicle. How do you choose and what's the current trend recognizing that things often flex a little bit uh, in medicine year over year? Okay. Um, so the bottom line is that all modern, you know, just like there, there are different bells and whistles, but you know, the, the modern hip replacements are all the same. So you didn't see my disclosure side at the beginning, but my son is uh, works with J and J, and uh, you know so uh, I don't use any J and J products. We use Zimmer products because uh, that's what we use at our hospital. But you know the bottom line is it doesn't matter what company or what manufacturer; they all look the same. You know, so there's really nothing to choose between a modern, uncemented implant. What's different? potentially is the use of cement or no cement, and that's generally based on the type of bone quality that the patient has. So, you know, for those, you saw the microscopic little bone growing into the metal pores, and if somebody's got really osteoporotic bone or bad bone or weak bone, elderly bone, where that can't happen, then we use cement. So, um, there's really no, all of the bugs have been ironed out. So, and in, in, we could talk about this for a very long time, but you've heard of resurfacing, or some of you will have heard of resurfacing. That was a solution to a problem with specific implants, and those solutions have all occurred. So there's really nothing much on the things that are fixed into the bone. The things that move, the plastic and metal, there's still some options there, but really the modern plastic, the modern metal, uh, is uh, is such that there's really not much uh, concern, and, and all the manufacturers basically have the same. And um, I guess uh, Dr. Ravi, um, that's great. Um, uh, you alluded a little bit to evidence and uh, research on sort of injections and so forth. So the, the, the a couple of I guess questions that revolve around the same theme. Um, you know, how close are we from cartilage regeneration is a commonly asked question and uh, injection of things like such as synthesis and so forth. So I guess maybe an explanation of what that is and what the current state of evidence in art. Sure. Um, so of the injections, uh, well, one question was about synthesis or orthovisc, but it's basically visco supplementation, which is almost, um, we we'll think of it almost as a lubricant or uh, other type of material injected into usually the knee to help things glide smoothly. Uh, the evidence for these uh, for the use of uh, visco supplementation is not strong. Uh, there are some people generally. For, this is not going to sound very scientific, but generally there are some people that swear by them and feel it does give them improvement. I generally tell patients maybe ten percent or less feel good, and those that feel good tend to really like it, but most patients are disappointed with visco supplementation. The other injection is steroid, steroid and some local anesthetic like they get at the dentist when they're doing stuff to you, uh, or really any other small surgical procedure, and that provides a short-term pain relief, typically a few months at best. I tend to tell patients that if they are going on a trip where they have to do a lot of walking or maybe they're going to someone's wedding and they want to be able to dance. That's usually when I'll give them an injection and week just before so they can maximize the benefit from it. Uh, but even there's a study demonstrating recently. Whose study would that be, Dr. Ravi? It's his study. He's very modest. 
a lot of the data he showed here earlier in this talk is actually his research, so he's very modest man. <laughs> but yeah, thank you. There's, I actually am supervised by Dr. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, injections can make this, a subsequent surgery more risky. It increases the risk of an infection slightly, but, but it will increase and may not give you any long term benefit. In terms of cartilage regeneration, the evidence uh, so far, there's nothing out there that has really shown any benefit. And there's a lot of hype now around stem cells. And I know I was a little flip earlier when I said these don't work, and, uh, but they cost a lot of money. But those are the facts. There's no evidence showing stem cell injections work, both in terms of reducing pain or even regenerating cartilage in a real live human being. There's just no evidence that works. So I would think very carefully about uh, paying for any kind of injection and really ask yourself why you're not considering another option like physiotherapy or weight loss and not even surgery, but try another option that does have evidence to support it. Yeah, and I guess um, you know, there continues to be a lot of research focus in that area. We're yeah. not necessarily there yet. Um, exactly. Uh, so the service, uh, Sunnybrook and other places are doing a lot of research looking at cartilage supplementation uh, or regeneration, I should say. But you know, we're not there yet, and look, we might be there one day. But I don't think it's going to be soon. Particularly not in humans, at least not in humans, at least. And, and I guess the last question I have, given you're the medication expert, and uh, I never thought starting my practice in 2001 that I'd be officially asking this question, but now that it's a, official and regulated, et cetera, et cetera, uh, what are the statistics on marijuana use, uh, different types of either the hip that would be? Interesting that you would ask me this, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, as far as I know, but most of the literature on medical marijuana has focused on people with long-term chronic pain, such as cancer pain. I'm not aware of a lot of, uh, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist, I'm just not aware of the literature on arthritic pain. There are studies looking at it for pain after surgery, uh, but those studies are ongoing. I think they're uh, certainly very, especially with what's happening uh, with uh, cannabis in Canada, this is only this can become a very uh, relevant question. But I think right now there aren't a lot of facts. Uh, although Dr. You might be trying to prove me wrong here. What, what are we doing? Marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, know, I want to see how many hits uh, of that. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So thanks so much. Uh, we'll. we'll Move on now. Um, it's uh, my great privilege to be able to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Richard Jenkinson. Uh, apart from being an expert hip and knee uh, arthroplasty surgeon, he is also a um, uh, our uh, orthopedic uh, trauma head uh, for the uh, Division of Orthopedic uh, Surgery. Uh, he's going to provide a bit of an update to us as we sort of segue from the hip uh, towards uh, the knee. Um, I, I know there's also a lot of um, medical experts around the field as well. I'd like to acknowledge. Uh, uh, individuals that are helping us with uh, key issues in terms of uh, thromboembolic uh, things, in terms of blood clots and, and other aspects of medical care that's obviously necessary for um, expert care of our patients. So, uh, Dr. Jenkinson, um, we'll hopefully get the presentation uploaded momentarily. All right. Thanks for the uh, introduction there, Dr. P. I put the talk up earlier, hopefully it's still there. So, um, as uh, Dr. Yi said, uh, the first speakers concentrate quite a bit on hips, and uh, I'm going to move on to the knee. Um, once we get this uh, loaded up. Uh, there's quite a few similarities with uh, what Dr. Ravi was talking about in terms of um, when we need to do a, uh, a joint replacement, and we'll touch on some of those, uh, those factors there. And then... Similar to Dr. Crater's talk about approaches, there's um, fewer options, but there's a few different uh, ways to do a knee replacement that's been uh, the press over the last several years. Right. Once you've been to the Mac, you'll never go back to the PC, Dr. Jenkinson. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> it worked before, and all of a sudden your talk went up, and then all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Dr. Jenkinson, uh, you know, it tells some great jokes that I think we should. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know if I think this is uh, appropriate for the, the group here. <laughs> I want to get to it. I don't want to try <laughs> well, I don't know if there's another question, uh, Dr. Nee, if uh, in your pile there we can maybe address while we're waiting. Um, I guess um, a question on acceptable, uh, what sort of recommended or acceptable physical activity for arthritic knees? I, mean, I know there's a, a variety of programs, uh, organized program structures such as the GLAD and others. Uh, there may be others that are recommended by uh, local uh, therapists and so forth. So you know, what uh, is recommended for patients who have arthritis but also pain from arthritis and how do they keep physically active? Yeah, so um, as, as Dr. Ravi and Dr. Crater showed in their, um, uh, their diagrams, as, as, as arthritis progresses, the cartilage starts to get worn down. And you can sort of imagine that uh, activities that are going to cause a lot of force on the cartilage are going to be the ones that are going to be particularly uncomfortable. And they're also the ones that cause uh, damage to accumulate uh, you know, faster than, than might otherwise happen. So you can think of the activities that are bad for the joints are things that are what we call high impact. So if someone is trying to uh, be a distance runner and, and keep uh, you know, running out um, uh, you know, long distances, uh, doing uh, sports where you're cutting and twisting, trying to play basketball with the, the 15 year olds, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, the kind of activities that uh, we recommend and uh, are good for anybody with arthritic joints or even after they've had a, a joint replacement and are worried about the joint replacement and how long it's gonna last. Uh, the so-called low impact things. So you basically, there's no limitations on walking, on swimming, on cycling. There's no, that's a nice smooth motion which doesn't cause any hard pounding on the joint. Uh, so those things can be done with impunity. And um, even if you do what light running here and there, that, you know, that, um, we've heard about pickleball before, so that's the, you know, the this tennis where you don't have to move too much. Those kind of um, uh, sports and activities are perfectly fine. Uh, it's really just the very heaviest of activities that we work, where, uh, people might wear their joints out with. Let's say you're a heavy laborer, or, you know, you're moving refrigerators for a living, that kind of thing. Um, try to get a different job or retire from that. So I think we're I think we're good to go now. Yeah. Okay. Just the arrows. So I have to be careful. Hopefully, we won't get into the same situation we're in before. So um, anyway, so this is uh, the talk. So we're gonna. Move on to knee replacements, as I said, trying to cover some of the when and the what and the how. And um, knee arthritis, so it's very similar to uh, hip arthritis, in that you get the deterioration of that smooth, protective articular cartilage layer. And uh, when you lose that, um, that smooth layer, you don't have the free mo uh, motion between the bones of the joint and the bones of the knee anymore. You get the grinding, the creaking, the pain, and that it also results in stiffness of the joint, it doesn't move as well as it used to. And uh, people end up with uh, you know, deformities as the joint, uh, as the joint wears uh, asymmetrically. So there's a diagram of the knee. And you can see on the, the left there, there's a, a diagram of the knee with nice healthy cartilage. Again, the white. And that uh, is nice and symmetrical and fully formed. The knee has the extra shock absorber cartilages called the meniscus cartilages. And uh, as the articular cartilage wears away, so is the, um, the meniscus cartilages. So shock absorbers get little tears. And a lot of people end up getting MRIs, which uh, uh, describe meniscal tears. And there's quite a bit of hand-wringing from um, general practitioners and the general public about that. But it's really just a part of the whole um, um, continuum of how arthritis and wear and tear affects the knee. And um, uh, it's not necessarily an issue unto itself. It's more part of the whole process that needs to be treated like we've been talking about and I'll get to in some slides uh, further along. So you can see that uh, picture on the, on the right and that's the, the worn out knee where the cartilage is really starting to get all bumpy and ground to pieces. So this is what it looks like on the x-ray. So a lot like that uh, hip x-ray that we saw, you can see the healthy knee on the right and that left one where there's all these extra bone spurs and it's uh, just not quite lined up right and the joint space between the bones 
that's all uh, all narrow too. So, let's see if this is working. Okay, we don't have a cursor. All right. So, how do we treat any osteoarthritis or OA? So the goals of treatment of osteoarthritis are um, same in the knee as they are in the hip, and that's to maintain function, to reduce pain, and to hope, hopefully, hopefully prevent progression of the uh, knee arthritis. But unfortunately, we know that arthritis does tend to uh, progress with time. We can't hope to slow it down sometimes. So what are the non-operative ways to treat it? Um, so there's activity modification, so we reduce the uh, uh, activities which cause damage. So uh, uh, really high impact things. Um, if you have a uh, activity which is particularly painful and you're able to switch to an activity which is less painful, that can be helpful. But you can only give up so much before you're in a wheelchair like Dr. Ravi's patient. Um, and then you also want to maintain and gain strength. The knee in particular, the muscles are very important for keeping your function and also limiting the pain. The balance of how the, the muscles uh, uh, keep the, uh, the kneecap lining up and, and stabilize the knee, it's very important. And as you get weaker, the pain actually gets quite a bit worse. So it's a bit of a vicious cycle. As you become less active, you become less strong, and you become more painful. And that just uh, feeds on itself for, for patients as they get um, further along in the arthritis uh, um, process. And as we mentioned before, weight loss can be very helpful. If you're carrying a lot of extra weight and you have the ability to, to reduce it, it takes a lot of stress off the joints. But knowing that uh, you know, that's not realistic for many people, many people are already thin, and if you are heavy, um, if you can't exercise, it's hard to uh, get into a fitter shape. Uh, ways to treat it, we've been through some of these. Uh, physiotherapy in the knee in particular is, is helpful. In the early stages, they, the therapist can be very uh, instrumental in helping people learn ways to exercise with less um, pain and to maintain their function for as long as possible. Particular braces can sometimes be helpful in, in knee joint arthritis. Medications we talked about, avoiding opioids is uh, good advice uh, for chronic conditions as we've uh, alluded to. Injections, we've been through that already. Cortisone can be helpful. The visco supplementation and the fancy stuff, notice a dollar sign. Um, you have to ask the person presenting you with the option for an injection who's really benefiting it from it. Is it the, uh, you as a patient or is it them as the provider who's getting a, a very large remuneration for injecting that stuff? So, knee arthritis operations. Uh, there's a few operations besides replacement. Osteotomies is a, a realignment of the knee. In some patients with early arthritis, that can be helpful. But most people, it's, um, it's not really an option. Uh, the knee scope or the cleanup, we've been through that already. And uh, the evidence is really mounting that uh, uh, an arthroscopic cleanup of a knee joint with arthritis is, uh, is not really standard of care in 2018. Probably wasn't in 1998 either, but it certainly isn't in 2018. So, if someone wants to come after you with a knee scope for arthritis, you should probably run away. Uh, knee replacements. So, these have been done for a while too. The first ones were done in the 60s. Um, and since that time, as uh, the procedures become more and more um, uh, utilized, there's uh, one million knee replacements done in the world every year at the current rates. About 70,000 knees are done in Canada, and 1,500 of those are done at the uh, Sunnybrook and the Holland Centre, which, as we mentioned, is probably the biggest number in Canada, certainly in Ontario. So we get lots of practice, good and bad. So we, we talked about the, the anatomy of the knee a little bit, and uh, going on to some particular options for knee joints, you have to understand that uh, we, we divide the knee up into three major parts. There's the inside part of your knee, your knee the medial side, there's the outside part of the knee, the lateral side, and then there's the, uh, the part underneath the kneecap, the patellofemoral joint. So sometimes patients can be eligible for a, a, a partial knee, um, and that's people who have arthritis that affects just part of the knee. Um, so, you know, most of the time arthritis is affecting all three joints, but sometimes you'll, you'll get that isolated uh, one compartment, particularly in the, the earlier stage of the disease. And uh, if that's the situation, then there is that option to just replace the, um, the part that's worn out. So you can see the, uh, in the diagram there how the, that, uh, that half of the knee has been replaced with the metal on each side, and there's a little plastic in between, which doesn't project very well in the diagram. Uh, but the, what's not shown there is all the ligaments and the rest of the, uh, the knee joint is intact. So that, that's sort of attractive. It keeps a lot more of the, 
the patient in place and less of, of our metal and plastic that we keep on our shelves. Um, so there's some advantages of that. There's an x-ray showing what that looks like in somebody from the front and the side view. We can see the staples there. It's a relatively small incision compared to uh, the full replacement. So um, the surgeon doesn't have to take out quite as much bone, smaller incision, maybe shorter hospital stay, but people don't stay in the hospital very much anymore for a full knee either. Um, quicker recovery has been uh, reported and um, it's a bit subjective, but people sometimes talk about having a more natural feeling in their knee compared to a total knee. But the disadvantages is, um, you know, it, it only solves part of the problem. If you have arthritis in three parts of your knee and you only fix one part of it, it stands to reason that you're not going to have as good a result as if you, you replace everything that needs to be replaced. Um, so persistent pain is, is, a, is a not uncommon after um, unicompartmental knee replacements. Uh, and, um, you know, they're just not as reliable because they're, they're done less uh, frequently. And if someone has quite a bit of malalignment, if you've got big bow legs or uh, knock knees because of your arthritis, you can't, um, you just don't have the opportunity to fix that as a surgeon uh, with only a partial knee replacement most of the time. And the biggest um, problem with the you know, compartmental knee replacements is they don't last as long. They're a much less durable operation. In the specialty centers, this particular knee that's uh, falling apart in that picture is called an Oxford knee. So at Oxford, where they do hundreds of these every year, they can demonstrate very good results. But almost everywhere else, and as the, the, um, the registries where joints are, are, um, are tracked as they're put into patients, and you keep track of them with this registry data, the, uh, the failure rates are quite a bit higher than a full knee replacement. And um, you know, most people want to have one operation. And, um, if you, want to, you know, if you want to have multiple operations and problems, I guess this is an option for, for those people. Um, so unicompartmental knee replacements, they are a good option for some patients. They might have that natural feeling in their knee and a little bit less early morbidity, but they have to be very carefully matched. So you need a very thoughtful and skillful surgeon and, uh, and to be a, a sensible patient who understands and can describe their problems well. And um, maybe, just maybe, there's a chance that this could be an option for you. Um, and then the surgeon doing that knee replacement, Dr. Crater mentioned how you don't want to be this, the patient of a surgeon who's learning a new technique. Um, it takes, uh, it takes several, several repetitions of something before you really master it. And you need to do that at a certain amount of time. So if you're going to a surgeon who does three or four unicompartmental knee replacements a year, they're never going to get mastery of that uh, operation. And um, as a patient, you're going to be suffering for that. So if you do consider yourself a unique compartmental knee replacement person, you need to see someone who does many of them, but uh, does them in a thoughtful way. Because if you're doing them for unnecessary patients, you'll get lots of practice, but maybe you're not practicing perfectly. Um, so the bottom line on knee compartmental knee replacements is that um, you know, if you actually look at people who present with knee arthritis and who uh, require a knee replacement, very few are, are good candidates for this unique compartmental knee replacement. So that brings us to total replacements, which is what the, the vast majority of uh, arthroplasties of knee replacements uh, are done, or the, the total type. And um, you know, this is uh, the best treatment for most patients who have arthritis because it affects more than just the one compartment of their knee, and it replaces that entire compartment. We also can, like I said before, correct some of the deformity. You can loosen the tight parts and tighten the loose parts and, and get everything lined up hopefully just right to get a good result. So how is that done? Well, this is a, somebody's knee opened up, and there's the, the metal cap on the end of the femur and the, the metal and plastic on the tibia, and you can see the, the kneecap is flipped over and there's a plastic button on top of that. So that's what it opened up. So um, what we do is, uh, Dr. Ravi said, is we cut off the arthritic ends of the bone and shape them up and then put on that smooth knee replacement to allow the joint to move properly. The technique is we open up the knee through the front. There's not really a back or a side way to do a knee replacement. The, uh, the way that the knee and the blood vessels and the muscles are, uh, are situated around the knee, the, the only sensible way is to go through the front. There's probably someone who's tried through the back, but when a patient wakes up without a leg, it's not a good thing. So, so they, didn't, uh, they didn't get their name attached to any, any operations. Um, but as I said, you go through the skin, we cut along the inside half of the knee as a kneecap, and we move the kneecap out of the way. Usually flip it over, but that's, uh, that's just uh, 
an optional part. And then once we're underneath the skin, we can um, you know, cut through the side of the kneecap in slightly different ways. Um, a minimally invasive uh, technique has been popularized. If you Google it, you might find some websites that still talk about this. And uh, there's slightly different ways to cut the tendon. The traditional one is that one with the red line on the left, which is a medial peripatellar approach that is, is done routinely. And then if you slightly alter that by where you're going on the uh, quadricep muscle on the, the inside part of the knee, it can be called a mid-vastus or a sub-vastus approach. But you're basically doing the same thing underneath, sort of like Dr. Crater described with the hip, um, hip situation. So disadvantages of minimally invasive knee surgery. Um, so if you try to do the same operation through a smaller incision, um, if it goes well, you look like you're pretty smart. But if it doesn't go well, you know, you're spending a longer time doing the operation. The surgeon has less ability to see what they're doing. And if they put them in the wrong way, then you get a disaster like that picture where the knee replacement is completely dislocated and, and uh, just not working at all. And that person's a lot worse after their surgery than they were before. So the minimally invasive knee replacements, they, they have got a lot of press, a little bit like the direct anterior approach uh, is getting a lot of press over the last year or two. If you were looking at knee replacement uh, uh, websites and literature 10 years ago, people were talking about MIS knee replacements. And if you look carefully, they're not talking about that anymore. They've, they've moved on to other ways to market themselves. And uh, I think the main reason for that is, you know, having been around not that long, but long enough to have been through a few cycles of the, uh, the hype and, uh, and echo, um, you see a few patients who have had very poor outcomes from knee replacements put in in a very poor way technically because the surgeon was struggling to do a small incision. And... Um, and uh, didn't do their patient any favors, unfortunately. So I think because the potential benefits of the minimally invasive knee uh, that was promoted a few years ago are very small, and the downside's very big, um, people that uh, don't like to get sued and like to have patients who are happy have stopped sort of talking about that and just do a good job with that. Uh, and like uh, Dr. Crater said, um, the people who trained Dr. Crater back, uh, you know, in the in the... 19th century. They, uh, they needed, to, they needed to, to use really big incisions. They didn't have uh, some of the better retractors and techniques and um, x-rays maybe and maybe just not quite the same understanding for, uh, as we've developed over generations of, of surgical training that uh, larger incisions were, were the norm and expected and um, we've realized that um, you know smaller incisions and you know, opening up the person more than you need to doesn't make a lot of sense. So none of us are doing excessive incisions, um, but um, uh, the you know to struggle to do less than is necessary is only going to do harm to people. So what what can we expect of knee replacements in 2018? I think this is a common thing that's uh, out there. People don't really know what to expect, but you know knee replacements uh, they can really change your life. This is a person who's jumping off a dock. You can imagine maybe they were unable to do that before, they've got the knee replacement and now they're, they're very happy. So that's, that's great. Um, so, you know, is, is, is this what we have? You know, not quite. You know, the, I guess it was the 70s that this show is from, that uh, imagined building people better than nature. We, we can definitely uh, make, uh, make someone a much better knee than an arthritic knee. Not quite as good as that knee you had when you were you know, back in your 20s maybe before arthritis started to develop. Um, but it's pretty darn good. Uh, a little, a little clicking, a little minor discomfort, a little swelling. That's pretty much par for the course. Almost everyone has a knee where they're they're saying, "Oh, it's not, not quite perfect, but it's it's so much better than my my arthritis, and my life is so much better. I'm not pushing around my walker anymore. I'm not stuck in my house because of my pain." Um, and that's that's the story we get. Um, and then. You know, there is some, some bad press in knee replacements. Uh, there's a small subset of people that, um, if you, you do enough research on expectations, that about um, 15 to 20% of patients are, are quoted as being dissatisfied following surgery in, in some studies. Um, interestingly, most of those dissatisfied patients would still say they would have the surgery, and they, they admit that they're better than maybe they were before, but they were hoping for better results. So, you know, no one's going to be able to, uh, as a surgeon, generate a 100% happy patient rate. That's what we're all shooting for. But to improve on, on that, I think um, 
good, with good communication of the surgeon of what the patient should expect and, um, and really understanding their situation. And as Dr. Ravi pointed out with the assessment center, we have that, um, that advice and help from the, um, the advanced practice therapists who, who really have as, as good an understanding of arthritis and where knee replacements and hip replacements fit in as well as any of us surgeons do. Um, they can really give people that, that really good um, um, priming before surgery so they can really understand what's, um, what they're getting into and what to expect. And um, when you sort of go in with your eyes open and you're actually bad enough to, to be a good candidate for the surgery, I think a lot less than 15 to 20% of people are dissatisfied. And of course, the surgeon has to execute, execute good surgery, and then the patient and therapist have to do their part afterwards, but that's what we'd expect. And a quick word on what to expect from longevity. Really, you know, they last a long time. About 80 to 90% should last more than 20 years. There's this conventional wisdom that you can only expect 10 years, um, but we can and do do better than that in 2018. This is a, a little article that uh, showed some of the survival rates. So if you look at that top curve, that's the, the green curve from Dr. Crater's mentors. That's when people were learning how to do knee replacements back in the 70s and 80s. And you can see that the, uh, the revision rate is what that CRR number on the left stands for. So, and the time is along the bottom. So as time goes by, um, patients are getting revised um, at quite a high rate. And those lower ones are the knee replacements done by by Dr. Crater, and then there's some there probably done by me, and none by Dr. Ravi yet, but his curve's been even lower. And you can see the curves go really low, and if you if you look at the blue or the purple, when you're getting to 10 years, over you know 95% or so of the knees are still still going strong. So if someone tells you it should only last 10 years, they're they're just trying to lower your expectations so they don't look bad and not wear as elderly. <laughs> All right, and what can you do to keep that uh, going well? So earlier revision surgery is associated with a few things, higher weight patients, patients who are, are very heavy with you know, BMIs or body mass indexes, which is the morbidly obese range, they're at a higher risk of revision surgery. Very young patients, male patients, and high impact activity can lead to it. So those sort of go together when you get the, uh, the, the um, stubborn person in their 40s who still wants to play sports with the 20 year olds, they're not a good candidate for a knee replacement. But the vast majority of people are smarter than that and can uh, keep their knee going a long time. Uh, other things that can affect the, uh, the uh, results, of course, they have early problems like infection and if there's surgical issues and complications. That's the main reason we really have to redo knee replacements nowadays is problems at the beginning. Um, wearing out, long-term wearing out is, is you know, pretty uncommon that we actually see that as a reason we have to redo things. So as a patient, you can't modify too many of those bottom ones, but um, if you go to a, an institution that has a, a good track record and a high volume, then uh, that's all you can really do and have a, a surgeon have a good feeling from when you do decide to think about new replacements for yourself or your loved ones. Thank you. Great. Uh, so thanks so much, uh, Dr. Jenkinson. Um, I don't know, maybe we could do a quick stretch for 30 seconds. We'll, uh, I guess, uh, uh, this period of time is sort of for a question and answer uh, period. Um, I think I had uh, a couple of questions. Uh, one is uh, how um, can uh, individuals get referred to the assessment center? So uh, there is uh, basically a 1-800 uh, number. Um, uh, a link with the hospital, uh, you need a, a basically a referral from your uh, primary care or family a physician um, that can be faxed in. Um, the contact details are online at the Ascendi Group uh, website. Uh, I've also put up the um, blog managed by um, uh, Paul uh, Taylor uh, for any other questions that we may not be able to uh, get to um, uh, this evening. Um, we have one question, um, I guess, relating to um, the effect of blood thinners and uh, um, I guess how that may influence uh, decision making before and after surgery. So uh, maybe I can start with Dr. Ravi on um, patients that may be already on blood thinners and how's that sort of managed um, around the time of surgery. Uh, most patients who are on blood thinners, I'll start by saying most patients before they get a joint replacement are usually screened 
by uh, an internist or an anesthesiologist. And often blood thinners are stopped at an appropriate date before the <laughs> surgery to minimize the risk of bleeding during the surgery and to minimize the risk of bleeding depending on the type of anesthesia you're receiving. Um, so uh, we operate on people on blood thinners all the time and they're managed uh, fairly effectively in terms of stopping their blood thinner before and then transitioning them back to that blood thinner after the surgery. Uh, earlier there was talk of blood clots. So after surgery, whether you're on blood thinners before or not, after surgery you will be on blood thinners for a short period of time to minimize the risk of a blood clot. And if you're on blood thinners before, we just transition you back onto what you were taking before. Okay. Um, the next question I had relates to anesthesia. I believe I can ask Dr. Jenkins on this. Uh, is a complete anesthesia necessary for surgery? Um, what are the various options and how uh, do our anesthesia colleagues sort of um, a dialogue with our patients in terms of uh, that uh, decision making process? Yeah. So, um, so um, the, the anesthesia options, the, the, there's combinations, but the main options are a spinal anesthetic where the anesthesiologist puts uh, medication around the spine and they have local anesthetic that freezes uh, the person from the waist down. That waist lasts for you know two to four hours while we do the operation. Um, theoretically, a person can be fully awake while that happens, but um, the, the usual routine is when the person is in the operating room with that spinal anesthetic, they get as much or as little sedation as they want so they can be fully asleep and off in dreamland and not aware of, of what's going on in the operating room. A lot of people are quite apprehensive that they're going to be hearing all the hard dirty jokes and the tools going on and, uh, and so forth. Um, some people want that. Um, some people want to listen to Dr. Rowdy's music. Um, but, uh, usually... Nobody does. I don't know what you're talking about there. Uh, most people want to be asleep. And it's a light sleep as if you were you know, having a nice uh, nap on a, on a, um, on a sunbed. Um, the other kind of anesthetic is a general anesthetic, and that's uh, a more complete anesthetic, which you're probably referring to, where uh, powerful medications are given that stop breathing, and uh, the, the ventilator machine sort of keeps the person going while we do the operation, and they're fully, um, fully under, and then they're reversed from that and woken up again. So that's a little bit of a, a more physiologically demanding um, treatment, and. Um, most patients, the spinal is better tolerated, there's less nausea, less medical risk. Um, uh, but it's not always an option, so the general anesthetic is sometimes required for, for some people. And either way, there's usually the supplementation with what we call a regional anesthetic, where the anesthetist, uh, uh, sort of like the dentist would freeze up your mouth to do uh, your fillings, they freeze up the nerves around the leg. Some of those ones that Dr. Crater showed, uh, they'll stick some local anesthetic around there to, uh, to freeze up the leg for after surgery to minimize uh, pain and, and uh, make you feel better sooner. Great. Um, so I'm probably going to go through the list of questions. I don't know, Margaret, whether we can link with the IT. I don't know if there's a uh, portable mic or something in case there's uh, pressing questions from the audience in the group. Um, I'll ask a tough question, I guess, to Dr. Greeter, who's the uh, uh, is a key medical leader and key advocate in terms of uh, research oh, related to providing uh, health care for our patients, recognizing the uh, system that uh, uh, we um, uh, obviously have to work within. Uh, what is the wait time for referral uh, for surgery to uh, taking place currently? So um, I think uh, the, the important thing to know is that there is information on the government website regarding wait time. And if you find yourself on a long wait list, log into that and see if there are options for a shorter wait time. So what we do here at the Holland Center, uh, the arthritis, uh, uh, the, the Holland Bone and Joint Center, is we have an option when your family doctor refers you to the first available. Now we all have fairly lengthy wait times, but at least you know, there's no reason to wait for one or the other. We all do the same work. So uh, there is that option to go to the first available surgeon. And if you go through the assessment center, uh, I think like Dr. Ravi showed you, you know, you'll be assessed within a matter of weeks and you may have alternative, you may want to get better prepared for surgery. So it's not just always a passive wait. Oh, I'm waiting for something to happen. Uh, hopefully, you know, during that wait, if you go through the assessment center, 
you'll be educated on how to be better prepared. You know, how to get stronger muscles so that you recover faster. Maybe give up some of your vices, uh, you know, like smoking or chocolate in my case. I love chocolate. Um, you know, so it's not just necessarily a, a passive weight. And then, yes, it will be a matter of months at our center before you can get in to see a surgeon, but there's also a triage system. So, you know, if you're one of these people that Dr. Abby showed that's at that grade three or four, you know, and you come to the assessment center in a wheelchair, we will move things around. We will occasionally cancel patients or shift patients around to try and get that patient prioritized so that they don't have to wait longer than they need to. So we, we have some flexibility, but to be honest, it, it is for a routine case a matter of months after you've been assessed. But during that time, hopefully, as I say, you're getting better prepared and therefore your risk and your, your, your recovery will be improved. I think I just add to that currently the wait time for the next available surgeon that is from the time you see the surgeon to when that surgeon is operating on you is about four to five months at the home center. So I think fairly uh, reasonably faster compared, than, compared to other major hospitals. Um, I guess Dr. Ravi, um, there's a question about surgery and uh, maybe uh, concurrent or simultaneous or bilateral if or knee replacement, uh, when's it indicated or not? Uh, what's the approach to that? So, uh, bilateral knee replacement is more common than bilateral hip replacement. Uh, although Dr. Frieder does do bilateral hip replacements occasionally. In terms of bilateral knee replacements, generally, uh, the, what, what I tell patients is that it's a lot of surgery for one person to take at one time. And I find uh, there is some literature suggesting that there's a higher risk of medical complications, that is things like a heart attack or a stroke or maybe a blood clot if you get both knees replaced at the same time, mainly because it's such a, it's a lot for one person to take, especially if they were in that sort of grade three or four before, they weren't doing so well, so they don't have a lot of reserve to fall back on after the surgery. That being said, there are times where you do operate on, on both knees at the same time. If someone is uh, particularly suffering, if both knees are just terrible, both in terms of symptoms and x-rays, and they literally do not have a good leg to stand on, so they can't recover after one knee replacement, we just make sure all those patients are cleared by our medicine team to make sure that they're healthy enough to withstand surgery. Because again, as I said, there is the potential risk that they might have a tougher time afterwards. Um, but really the factors are the patient comfort with it, the patient's health, whether or not they actually need both knees replaced, obviously, and uh, whether or not they're safe to receive it. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Dr. Jenkinson, um, you know, uh, uh, many patients may have had a prior knee injury before the herald of uh, arthritic symptoms um, that may consider a knee replacement. So uh, it's not uncommon people have things such as uh, ACL tears, etc., etc. Uh, does having an ACL tear impact the type of knee replacement or the outcomes uh, uh, if there's arthritis that develops subsequently? Yeah, so um, it's a, a bit controversial with how direct a link there is between some knee injuries and arthritis, um, uh, ACL injuries in particular, but certainly repetitive trauma of the knee, uh, there's fractures of a misaligned the knee, you're very likely to get arthritis later. And um, that can sometimes complicate things, but usually, um, unless uh, there's been dramatic trauma to the knee, the knee replacement options are pretty similar for someone who's had a, uh, an injury uh, in the past to someone who's developed sort of old-fashioned arthritis. There's a few different technical factors with the knee replacement uh, in terms of what you do with some of the ligaments. So um, if you've lost the ligaments from trauma, you may need a slightly different type of knee replacement, but they're, um, they're, they're equivalent in, in a pretty important way from a patient's uh, perspective. Okay, and uh, Dr. Creator, if I can ask you the continuing hard questions. The, um, uh, there um, is a question about the individuals who may have had a couple of the hip replacements uh, removed due to recall. Um, so, uh, how can this be avoided and uh, 
that may be something that uh, patients yeah, that, that, that's a, a really good question. You know, and um, it, it, you know, as surgeons, um, you know, most of us, and especially the <laughs> the more experienced we are, and that doesn't necessarily mean having been in practice a long time. It can mean being new in practice, but having worked with somebody uh, who's been a great mentor. And, and in my case, I was fortunate to have Dr. Marvin Tyle and Joe Schatzker as mentors. And, uh, you know, I uh, was always taught, and I think uh, most surgeons, that you don't jump on the newest bandwagon, especially if it doesn't make sense and if there isn't research to support it. So, you know, that applies to the newest and, and potentially greatest. So I'll, I'll tell you a little uh, personal story. So when I was a resident, you know, there was a new hip that was developed in Italy. It was called the isoelastic hip. And if you look it up, it, it probably still uh, out on Google there somewhere. And the idea was that it would bend with the bone. It had the precise elastic properties of bone. And the idea was, well, it'll never fail because it'll move with the bone. It sounded great. So I was badgering my uh, my mentors, my teachers as a trainee, as a resident, said, we, we need to get this thing. You know, it's the latest and greatest. There have been thousands put in in Italy and around the world. And, uh, you know, Dr. Schatzker at the time, eh, let's just wait, you know, let's see what happens. Within five years, 100% of them have failed. 100%. And they don't make that isoelastic magic hip anymore. So, you know, it's a balance. So uh, some of the recalled items, uh, you know, made sense. Others, there were nuances that suggested that maybe that was going to be a problem. But the bottom line is you need to choose a surgeon that you can communicate with. And, and we all have different styles and, you know, everybody looks for something different. But the bottom line is find a surgeon that you trust and take their advice. And, uh, you know, sometimes we make mistakes, we're wrong. You know, uh, the implant we chose or the specific technique led to complications, you know, we're not perfect. But I think that's, that's what I would suggest is the best insurance against uh, ending up with, a, you know, an isoelastic hip that's gonna fall apart for five years. But there's no magic, you know, we do make mistakes. So I think that uh, key piece of obviously um, having that dialogue with your uh, surgeon is uh, critically, critically important uh, because everything is cyclical. And uh, I think we're very fortunate to have a panel of cumulative 40, 45 years of uh, clinical uh, practice in surgery and with the two days. <laughs> So I guess with that in mind, uh, I've gone through most of the questions um, uh, from a thematic perspective. The last few I will forward on to uh, Paul Taylor and um, um, we'll ask our colleagues to provide maybe a bit of input in terms of the uh, uh, the weekly uh, blog. Um, I just want to acknowledge and thank uh, Monica and Matt for all your help in the uh, As well as uh, Margaret, Vera, and many uh, Volunteers that uh, along with the panelists have taken time away from the family to be here tonight and to uh, have this dialogue with um, with the community and with our patients. So thank you.